Welcome to my home. This is um, an exciting opportunity to start on a new Bible study on discovering the wonder of Jesus. This Thanksgiving, I found myself in a hotel in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and that was a new experience for me. Usually I'm surrounded by family, and this year I was in a hotel, and I was up earlier than anyone else, so I made myself a cup of coffee, and I crawled into the bathroom and set up a little place on the floor where I could read and talk to Jesus. And he led me to the Gospel of Mark, and I began to study the Gospel of Mark, and I found myself, as I was reading, captivated, captivated by the wonder of Jesus. And in the Gospel of Mark, what you find is the first seven chapters are just this waterfall of stories about the person of Jesus. They come so fat one right after another in such quick succession that you almost can't even absorb all that it's trying to say. And as I, as I sat there on the bathroom floor in, in my hotel room, I found myself lost in worship and wonder, who is this Jesus who has come to us? And lately, as I've been praying for our world, and as I've been listening to Christians who speak on radio and television, I found myself with a burden on my heart that we would remember again, and we, we would come face to face again with the person of Jesus. What is the incarnation all about? What did God do when he came to us in the person of Jesus? And then what does Jesus want to do in us? In moms and in wives and in women and with our co-workers, what does he want to do in recreating in us the image of God? And so that's, I got so excited about, about understanding who Jesus was that I found myself um, super excited about these Bible studies that we're going to have together. It was funny. I have an older sister who has four daughters and a younger brother who has four daughters. They both have a sets, sets of twins. So my sister's daughters are between 19 and 21. And my brother's little girls are between the ages of six and ten and it was sweet at thank um at christmas time my niece who's eight wrote a christmas letter to my niece who's 20 and this is what she said in her letter she said sadie i hope you remember the true meaning of christmas and we thought that was really funny because Sadie was involved in a real serious relationship and we thought she all needed to remember the true meaning of Christmas. And then she said, Jesus came to save, heal, protect, and rescue. And then she added in her little scribbly script and many other things. And as I read her little description from Lucy to Sadie, I thought that is the truth. He's come to save us, to heal us, to rescue us, to protect us and many other things. And that's what I want us to talk about in these sessions together. He is the hope of the world. And that's what he wants us to live out. What does it mean to live as those who belong to the Savior and the hope of the world? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark 1. We're going to start right at the very beginning, and then we're going to, we're going to make our way through the first seven chapters in these next six weeks together. So this is chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 13. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of, re of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, the sandals strap, whose sandals strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. If you'll pray with me for a minute before we begin our study together. Jesus, thank you for the privilege of meeting with women who love you. And we want to get a better sense of who you are and of what you've come to do in us, 
in our families, in our nation, and in our world. So would you open your word to our hearts so that we have eyes to see and ears to hear and we can see you for who you are. Now we love you and we worship you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The part of Mark 1 I really want us to focus on is the part of John's witness to Jesus. As I was reading this, um, I thought there are four characteristics that, that appear about who this Jesus is that sets up the whole book of John. And the first one is John's witness, and he says, There comes one after me who is mightier than I. And that is what Jesus, when Jesus comes to us, he comes to us as the mighty one. The one who has strength and power to handle all the needs of our hearts and all the needs of our day. So in the Hebrew, mighty means abundance, more than enough, plentiful, overflow. In the Greek, it's a little bit more, um, it means force, power, strength. And I think when you put both of them together, what you find is a beautiful picture of what God can do in our life. He is the mighty one. And that's how John the Baptist understood him. And that's how Jesus wants us to understand him. And do you know what I think we need to do? We need to recognize him again as the mighty one. He's the one who comes into our world as with might and power. And I looked at some of the places in the New Testament where this word might is used. And so I'm just going to use my notes to, to re, um, read some of them so you get a sense of this might. He, Ephesians 1 19 and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead Jesus Christ is mighty over death that was God's mighty power at work to raise Jesus from the dead and then in Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Remember, Ephesians 6 is setting up the, the battle as Christians that we face. We are in a battle against the principalities and the powers of this dark world. And he says, be strong, not in our own power, not in our own strength. Be strong that is in the, in the mighty power of God. That is the might to fight against evil. And then 1 Peter 4.11. I love this one. I've never seen this before. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it with the ability, the might, which God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion. He is mighty to give us strength to give witness to himself. I love that. That's a promise. Your witness to Jesus and my witness to Jesus doesn't come out of our own strength or our ability or our smartness or our planning. It comes out of the might that is given by God himself. He is mighty to glorify himself through our lives. And then 2 Thessalonians 1.9, punishment from his mighty power, his might in judgment we all are accountable with what we do with our lives and what we believe about Jesus to God himself. And he is mighty in his judgment. And then Revelation 5, 12 and 7, um, 18, he says, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And that word strength is the word might. He is mighty and deserving of worship. That might is what produces worship in us. And then finally in Isaiah 63, 1, he says, I that speak in righteousness am mighty to save. And that was the one that I think summed it all up to me. I am I, in my righteousness. I am mighty. I am mighty to save. And I think there are parts of our lives today where we say, Jesus, we need to know you are mighty to work in our lives today, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our families, in our marriages, in our communities, in our churches, in our nation, and in our world. Maybe more than we've known for, for decades and maybe for centuries, we are in need to know the mighty works of God in our midst. And I think it begins as we as believers look to him and say, you are the mighty one. I was thinking back over the last year and I said, Jesus, what are some places I've seen your mighty works in my life? And do you know what? They were so personal. They, they had to do with my family. They had to do how God orchestrated circumstance, how he brought us out of painful situations and made a way through dark places for us. And I think if you say, Jesus, where have I seen your mighty power at work in my life? He will begin to show you the thread of his beautiful presence in the last year of your life.
And if you say, I haven't seen him work for me, then I think you do, we need to sit down and say, you are the mighty one. And we are ready to see your mighty work in our lives and in the lives of our families. So Jesus, what do you need to do in me so that you're free to be who you are in my life? And that is the mighty one. But then John goes on and he gives another witness to him. And this witness is a little, um, I love this. He says, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And I thought, he's not worthy. Jesus is worthy. So Jesus is mighty. Jesus is worthy. And this is what he says. Why is he worthy? I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He is worthy because he is the giver of the Holy Spirit. And this is what I thought. John the Baptist baptized with water, the symbol. Jesus comes and baptized with the Holy Spirit himself, the reality. And that's what happens when we meet Jesus. When we meet Jesus for who he really is, we see reality as it really is. Life itself in the person of Jesus Christ. We see God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And then we realize who we are and we realize who he is. He is worthy. And that's what John the Baptist said. You are, you are worthy. I am not even worthy to untie your, your shoelaces. And then you'll remember in John 3, how John describes him. I love this, this this description of Jesus. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks from the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies. This is the, re the reality that Jesus is the bridegroom. John the Baptist is the bride. So what does the one who is worthy, what do we do? We have the opportunity to celebrate. We have the opportunity to be the friend of the bridegroom. We celebrate the one who is worthy. And that's what we're going to do around the throne. That's what Revelation 5, 7 says. We will worship around the throne of Jesus. But then not only, I was thinking about all the places in scripture where someone says, I am not worthy. It happens three times that I could find. The first one is this, this with John the Baptist. The second one is the centurion. Remember, he comes to Jesus and he says, my servant is sick. And Jesus says, okay, I'll come. I'll come and heal him. And he says, no, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But I am a man under authority, and I say the word, and one servant does this, and one servant does that. Just say the word, and my servant will be made well. And so Jesus, and then Jesus says, I've not seen this great of faith anywhere in all Israel. So, and he speaks the word, and his servant is healed. The centurion says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but I know you have the authority over sickness, over death, over my servant, over me. Just say the word. So when we come face to face with Jesus, we not only celebrate him as a bridegroom, we come under his authority and say, you are Lord, Lord of our lives, Lord of our situation, Lord of our families, Lord of all and we want to, we believe that you just say the word and life is ordered how it's supposed to be ordered. And so we worship you as the one who makes things right. And then there's another, there's another example in Luke of someone who says, I am not worthy and it's the prodigal son. And he says, I am not worthy that, um, to, I am not worthy to come back into your house as a, as a son, but would you take me as a, a servant? The prodigal son says to his father. And I think when we come face to face with Jesus, we realize that Jesus is the way into the heart of the Father. And I think that's the beautiful thing that we find in Jesus is there's no other way to understand the heart of the Father except Jesus. He says, I am the way. And when we understand the heart of the Father, we understand it's all love. It's all um, living together in, in unity and love. When I have a 16 year old daughter. And one of the things I love is watching her with her daddy. They'll go on shopping expeditions to Sam's. That's one of their favorite things to do. And she'll, she'll say, Daddy, I think Mommy needs these Tupperware. Daddy, I think um, Isaiah needs this. I think we need to buy this. I think that, and in her mind, there's no understanding of, um, no understanding of budget, no understanding of maybe that's not the wisest purchase right now. There's just a sense, oh, if we need it, my daddy will provide. 
And that's the sense when we come to our father's heart with a sense of absolute trust. My daddy will take care of me. My daddy will do what's needed. Absolute love, absolute trust. We say, when we, Jesus is our way to see the heart of the father. And when we see the heart of the father, we say, we're not worthy. And Jesus says, that's okay, because I am the one, I am the way into the heart of the father. And so, so these, Jesus becomes the one that we worship as, the, as worthy. And that's what Revelation um, says, um, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might be unto God and um, forever and ever. Then the next thing is, um, not, in, not only does he, uh, not only is he mighty, not only is he worthy, but he's the giver of the Holy Spirit. And I love this. Okay, the Holy Spirit is not the symbol, it's the reality. So there are three times that the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the in in the gospel in Mark 1. And they're all right here. I mean they're um, I'm sorry. There are three times he's mentioned in in Mark. And they're all right here within five verses. Um, I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. So three times we see the Spirit right away. Um, Jesus is, is um, anointing with the Holy Spirit. He's baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Here's the interesting thing. If you go through the rest of the Gospel of Mark, the word Spirit is used over and over again. Because five times out of ten, there are ten miracle stories, and five of those miracle stories deal with the casting out of unclean spirits. And there, when you put them all together, you find this amazing um, con- confrontation between the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of the world, the spirit of evil. And so you have in one twenty six the very first miracle that Mark do, um, that Jesus does in Mark. There's a, in the synagogue. There's a man, and he has um, an unclean spirit. And Jesus says to him, "Be quiet." And come out of him. And immediately the spirit leaves. And then in 311, he's healing and they're unclean spirits and he's casting them out. Then in 5, in in chapter 5, Jesus comes across into into the village of the Gadarenes. And remember, there's the man in the tomb. And he's so full of evil spirits that um, when Jesus casts them out, it it drowns 2,000 pigs. The level of darkness and evil was so great in that, in that man. And then what you have in um, 725, you have the Syrophoenician woman who's got the little daughter who's possessed by an evil spirit. And she comes to Jesus and Jesus says, I don't have time for you. You are not part of the Jewish nation. And she said, oh, you have to have time. You're the savior of the world. You have to have time for my little daughter. And Jesus heals her and casts out the evil spirit. And then in 917, after the transfiguration, he's been in all of his glory revealed to his disciples. And then he comes down and the very first person he meets is a father who's saying, have mercy on me. My son has an unclean spirit. Five times in the gospel of Mark, the spirit of Jesus meets the spirit of the unclean and God casts out the evil and transforms it. And that's what I think Jesus wants to do in our lives and in our world. The spirit of Jesus wants to enter into our world and he wants to say, I can transform this by my spirit. It's not what I do, it's who I am. And when I encounter the evil spirits of the world, they are transformed and cast out. I was thinking of um, George MacDonald's A Tutor's First Love. Many of you ha- may have read this book. But in this story, there's a, a daughter of a, just a servant. And they live high in the mountains. And the father works in the manor house down below. And she, she knows God. And so do her parents. And so she, um, the story is about how she leaves her little mountain home, which is safe and where she talks to God and meets him. And she goes as um, a helper to another home, a very wealthy home. And inside that home, evil, there, there are things that are happening that are evil. But wherever Margaret goes, the presence of God goes as well. And the power of evil is broken. And Margaret doesn't feel afraid. Margaret doesn't know what's happening. But George MacDonald traces what happens whenever she goes, light goes, life goes, joy goes, and the power of evil is broken. When the spirit of Jesus meets the spirit, the unclean spirit of the world, then the spirit of Jesus can transform it and cast it out. 
And this is what Jesus does. He comes to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. So that as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we go into our schools, into our grocery stores, when we go across the street to our neighbor's house, or when we go overseas to missions, the Spirit of Jesus goes with us. The, the same Spirit that, that was in Jesus is in us. And so that everywhere we go, we go at, in the image of Jesus himself. And that's where the transformation of the world happens and you say well what can i what can i do for jesus what can, as we're filled with the spirit of jesus then every place we go can become an opportunity for him to share his love his light and his hope but then there's another thing that in the last the last thing that happens um jesus is baptized and he goes under the water and when he comes up the dove comes and sits on his shoulder and then there's a voice from heaven that says this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this is what he is. He's the beloved son. He's mighty. He's worthy. He is the giver of the Holy Spirit. And then he is the beloved son. Now, it's fun. In the Gospels, the beloved son, this, this is used eight times. I think they're all... Um, the baptism of Jesus and then at the transfiguration where you hear the voice of God twice in every gospel saying, this is my beloved son. This word beloved is used 28 more times in the New Testament, but it's not used of Jesus except for twice. Two times it's used of Jesus. The other 26 times it's used of other believers. And this is what I love about that, that the beloved son of the father has come to make us accepted in the beloved to make us the beloved ones and we see that this is what paul talks about in romans 8 for as many of you as are led by the spirit of god these are sons of god you did not receive the spirit of adoption again to fear but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out abba father the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children then heirs heirs of god and joint heirs with christ jesus and then in Galatians 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, an heir of God through Christ Jesus. So he comes as the beloved son, and that is his mission, to draw men and women, boys and girls, into the family of God, to make us accepted in the beloved. And that is, that is our inheritance. That is the hope that we have in Jesus. I was, um, if you look at the rest of the Gospel of Mark, it's really interesting to me, I mean, the rest of the chapter one, it's really interesting to me to see what he does. Um, because after this introduction where we see that he's mighty and he's worthy and he gives the Holy Spirit and he's the beloved son and makes us the beloved, then the first thing he does is he calls. He calls disciples. And we have the option to say yes. We have the option to respond to his voice. The next thing he does is he teaches with authority. And we have the option to listen or to close our ears. He's willing to teach us. He's willing to lead us if we listen. Then the next thing he does is he conquers evil. And he encounters e evil in the synagogue and he says, be cast out. And as we lay our lives before him, he will do that same thing to us. Say, Jesus, we want to be your disciples. We want to be those who hear your voice. And he'll begin to say, this in your life needs to go. This in your life needs to go. I want to fill you with my Holy Spirit. And when I fill you with my Holy Spirit, these things will have to go. As our allegiance is to Jesus and we make him Lord of our lives. And then we have the opportunity of saying, yes, Jesus, yes, what can we give? Because you are the one who makes things right. You are the one who orders our lives. And then he heals with his touch. So he comes to Peter's mother-in-law who's sick in bed and he reaches down and he lifts her up by the hand and she's healed. He wants to heal the broken places in our lives and he can do it with a touch. And so he says, where are the places in your heart, in your mind, in your background that I can come and I can heal? And then what I love is that she got up and served him. She got up and said, okay, now Jesus, what do I do? 
And that is what our, the, the desire of his heart for our lives. Okay, Jesus, we've seen you for who you are. We've heard your voice. We say yes. Now, would you touch the broken places in our lives, the places that need healing, so that we can say to you, okay, now what can I do? How can I serve you? And then one more thing in Mark 1. He says, um, a leper comes to him and falls down at his feet and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I love how Mark 1 ends. If you are willing. And Jesus says, I'm willing, be clean. Whatever you want to say, Jesus, I believe you're mighty. I believe you have the power to come and work at my life. If you are willing, will you come? And Jesus says to you and to me today, I am willing. I was uh, cleaning out some files of my grandfather today, and I found a really precious story. So Papa, when he was just young, was pastoring four country churches in North Carolina. And in one of the churches, he ran into a man named Tennessee. And nobody knew what his last name was. But what had happened to this man was he had been um, in a, his marriage, and he, his wife had an affair with a man, uh, with a, uh, a man who cut down wood. So Tennessee went out in the woods with a shotgun, and he was going to kill this man. And then he could never find the man to kill him, so he moved to Alaska, and he opened a gambling den in Alaska. And then I don't know how God brought him back to North Carolina, but he ended up being in one of the services and hearing Papa preach, and God touched his heart and his life, and he found Jesus. So Papa said to him, hey, why don't you travel with me? I'm traveling around and I'm doing some speaking. Why don't you speak? Why don't you travel with me? So he said one day he and Tennessee were in the car. And Tennessee was a pretty rough character. And they were in the car. And he said, Dennis, if I was going to be a preacher, I'd preach every Sunday on Jesus, on Peter walking on the water. And, uh, and Papa said, really? Why would you preach every Sunday on that story? Wouldn't it get a little boring? He said, nope. That's the heart of the message. You keep your eyes on Jesus or you drowned. <laughs> and as I read the story, I thought that's the essence of it. And that's what our, our culture needs today. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we don't look at the waves. We don't look what's around us. We don't look at the problems. We don't look at the people. We say, Jesus, we're going to fix our eyes on you. You are the Lord of all the earth. And then we're going to wait and watch see what you can do in our lives, our families, our homes, and our world.